meeting is being recorded. All right, so you can get started anytime. Good morning. I'd like to call this meeting to order. The time is 9 o'clock and today is Wednesday, March 24th, 2021. This is the one day meeting of the Physical Therapy Board of California. And today we're meeting virtually by WebEx. Uh, this is an official business meeting of the Physical Therapy Board and the board's role during the pandemic continues to be to maintain consumer protection and consult with local and state entities on the laws and regulations pertaining to the physical therapy industry. I would also like to explain how this meeting will be conducted. We do have a moderator from the Department of Consumer Affairs Online to help us today. Individuals listening to the meeting will have an opportunity to provide public comment and will be assisted by a moderator who will be facilitating the teleconferencing process. We will take public comment on specific agenda items and at, the, and at both the beginning and the end of the meeting, there will be a comment session for items not on the agenda. Public comments must be specific to the agenda item that is being discussed. If you make a comment during the specific agenda item that's not related to the topic, you'll be placed on mute by the moderator. All comments that do not relate to an item on the agenda should be held until the agenda item titled items not on the agenda. For those members of the public participating via teleconference, please wait until the moderator has introduced you before you make your comments. To request to make a comment during the public comment period, please press star one. You will hear a tone indicating you are in the queue for comment. If you change your mind, you do not want to make a comment, press the pound sign. The board follows the Open Meeting Act, so while we accept and appreciate the public's comments, we cannot respond to those comments. This meeting is being recorded and minutes of the meeting will be prepared. I'd like to ask the moderator if the instructions that I gave for public comment are actually correct. This is the moderator. Thank you. They were excellent and very thorough. Uh, the only correction I would make is for members of the public that are only called uh, at attending this meeting by phone, so they're not logged into a computer. If they wish to make a public comment, they would want to hit star three, and that would raise their hand and, and let me know that they want to participate in public comment. And then they just press star three again to lower their hand. But other than that, your uh, instructions were very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. Can we please have roll call? Alicia of any amen? Here. Katarina Ellaby? Present. Gail Armstrong. Present. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Daniel Drummer. Present. Jonathan Urban. Present. Tony McMillian. Present. All members are present with the exception of Jesus Dominguez and the board has a quorum. Thank you. Okay, and agenda item number three, reading of the board's mission statement. I'd like to ask Ms. Katarina Ellaby to please read the board's mission statement for us today. Uh, the mission of the Physical Therapy Board of California is to advance and protect the interests of the people of California by the effective administration of the Physical Therapy Practice Act. Thank you, Ms. Ellaby. And marching along to agenda item number four, now is the time uh, for public comment on items that are not on the agenda. So moderator, will you please facilitate a public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the question and answer panel. Uh, we also call it the Q&A panel. So if you would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference and we'll give you a moment to access this feature. All right, this is the moderator and at this time I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. It's closed. Okay. Agenda item number five, 
uh, review and approval of the September 17th, 2020 minutes. The September 2020 draft minutes um, begin on page 17 of the meeting materials. I'll go ahead and go through them page by page for any edits. Did anyone have any edits on page 17? Page 18. Page 19. Page 20. Page 21. Hi, Brooke. I have a couple. Yep. Go right ahead, Kevin. Oh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, line 166, uh, it reads, Dr. James Sims asked for licensees, and then who? Maybe whose is a better word there. Thank you. And then on uh, line number 183, capitalizing H in hat. Thank you, Ms. Elvie. I'll make those changes. Thank you. Also on um, line 183, uh, so Ms. Allensworth presented a virtual training for members. And um, I'm not sure if it makes a difference if we should change that to um, a recorded type of training versus a virtual training because it was a recording, not a live training. Okay, I'll make that distinction. Thank you. Any other edits on page 21? Uh, moving to page 22. Page 23. Page 24. Page 25, page 26, page 27, page 28. Do we need to be concerned about the breaks in some of the paragraphs, the formatting? I believe that may have happened with the changeover to a PDF. Ah, okay. I can I can change that though okay. on the um, the adopted meeting minutes. Okay, thank you. Any other edits on page twenty eight? Page twenty nine. Page thirty. Page 31. Page 32. Page 33. Page 34. Page 35. Page 36. And that concludes the September 2020 meeting minutes. I move to approve the meeting minutes as amended. Second. Motion by um, President Rubina Amon and a second by Dr. Trummer. Any board discussion? And moderator, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I will go ahead and open up the Q&A panel. So if any member of the public would like to comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and send it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions. All right, this is a moderator. I see no request for public comment. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please, thank you. You're welcome.
agenda item number. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving right ahead. We need to make a, a roll call vote. Alicia Ben Amen. Aye. Gail Armstrong. Abstain since I wasn't present. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Jonathan Irvin. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Six to zero. Motion carries. And um, one abstention. Oh, one one abstention. Thank you. Agenda item six. The next meeting minutes are the December 10th, 2020 meeting minutes, which begin on page 37. Did the board have any edits on page 37? I think only because in, in the next meeting minutes in February, there was a comment that um, Dr. Dale Armstrong was introduced, maybe adding that um, after agenda item number two that uh, Jonathan Irvin was introduced. Okay, I'll add that. Thank you. Were there any other edits on page 37? Page 38. Page 39. Page 40. And that concludes the December 10th, 2020 meeting minutes. Move to approve the December 10th, 2020 meeting minutes as amended. Second. Motion by uh, President Rubina Amon, second by Dr. Drummer. Any further board comment? And moderator, will you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on this item, please type, I would like to make a comment and submit it using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We are displaying instructions. This is a moderator. I see no request for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Agenda item number seven. Madam President. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm moving forward too quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Drummer. Uh, can we have a roll call vote, please? Alicia Ben Amen. Aye. Dale Armstrong. Abstain. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Elby. Aye. Jonathan Irvin. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Six to zero. Motion carried with one extension. Uh, five. Five. Oh, five. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now, agenda item seven, please. Okay, the uh, February 2021 meeting minutes begin on page 41. Um, were there any edits on page 41? Page 42. Page 43. And that concludes the February 24th meeting minute. Okay, I move to approve the February 24th, 21, or 2021 meeting minute. Second. Motion by President Rubina M. Amen, and second by Dr. Drummer. Any further uh, board discussion? And moderator, can you please facilitate public comment? 
Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment and submit it to all panelists using it. The field in the lower right hand corner of your screen. We are displaying instructions. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Shall I close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, let's see if I get this right. I think it's time for a roll call vote. Alicia Ben Amen. Aye. Dale Armstrong. Dale Armstrong. This is the moderator. Dale is logged in. I can uh, manually unmute her if you'd like. Uh, yes, Dale, try that. Dale, you've been unmuted. Uh, abstain since I was just an observer. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Daniel Drummer? Aye. Katarina Ellaby? Aye. Jonathan Irvin? Aye. Tanya McMillian? Aye. Five to zero, motion carried with one abstention. Thank you. Okay, agenda item number eight, President's Report. We're going to take a look at the 2021 uh, meeting calendar. And we are here in March. We have a one day meeting instead of a two day meeting. I think we can get through everything in just one day. Um, so, any board uh, comments on the proposed dates for the rest of the year? Or any comment from board staff, executive officer? Um, the only thing that I would add for the 2021 calendar is just to kind of keep open to the idea of adding a few extra dates towards the end of the year to um, accommodate the sunset process. I can't really make any recommendations yet at this point as to what those dates are, um, but I think it's something that we're going to have to revisit in June. And there is a possibility in June that we might not have um, the questions just yet, correct? There, there is still a, a possibility that we would not have the panel questions from the Sunset Committee, but we might have a better idea of okay. when we're going to be expecting them. Um, and just to be a little bit more proactive, we could always start to use, you know, last year's panel questions to kind of start to build a, a draft report from. Okay. Thank you. Any other board comments on the proposed meeting dates for the rest of this year? Okay, and moving on to um, 2022. Any board comment on the proposed dates for 2022? Staff comments? Only again, maybe just to keep in mind that we may be adding a date or two to the early part of the 2022 calendar um, to accommodate any kind of changes that we might have to um, implement as a result of the sunset hearings. Okay. Help me out here. Do we need uh, proper comment on this? Um, sure, it's always yeah. welcome. Okay. Okay. Um, moderator, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any members of the public wish to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference.
All right, we do have an individual that would like to make a public comment and this individual is identifying uh, himself as James Sims. So James, uh, just a friendly reminder, if you could try to keep it to two to three minutes and I will let you know when you're unmuted. And James, you've been unmuted. Hello, good morning. Um, just on the 2001, or I'm sorry, 2021 calendar, uh, after annual conference meeting is to be determined, it's going to be uh, October 9 and 10, and it's a virtual meeting. And that's all. This Thank is the moderator. Thank, Thank you, James. Uh, this, I, there are no further requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, agenda item number nine, executive officer's report. Thank you, Madam President. I realized while crafting this um, report that it is going to read kind of like a one year anniversary of a global pandemic, of a COVID-19 report card, if you will. So. Um, we'll start with admin services, for example. Um, with COVID-19, you might think that with travel restrictions and teleworking, that the admin unit of the PTBC would have an easy time of the pandemic. <coughs> In actuality, <laughs> it's very far from it. If anything, they've been even busier. Um, the admin unit serves as a hub for the PTBC, um, responsible for human resources, um, purchasing and procurement, facility, um, IT, cashiering and mail, as well as some higher functions like education and outreach, um, budgets, board member relations, legislation and regulation. Um, all of these things have seen an increase in workload um, since last March, since the inception of this pandemic. Um, we've had a, a constant stream of recruitment um, in the HR section of the admin unit, um, filling vacancies as a result of the new BCPs and promotions within PTBC. Um, and as you might imagine, COVID-19 has had an impact on recruitment as well, with the pool of candidates being a little bit harder to reach and having to conduct interviews via WebEx or electronic format. Um, but we've kept everything on board, and so they should be commended for that. Um, currently, the admin unit is closing out um, the recruiting of three positions, um, an SSA and the applications unit that would be tasked with out-of-state applications and military applications. Um, an office technician to provide support to the applications unit, and an office technician to provide support to the admin unit as well. Um, I'd like to congratulate Julie Thao, um, who has been promoted to SSA and will serve as the board relations um, liaison. She's been with us since 2019 and served as an OT in the admin unit. Um, her promotion is well deserved, and we're excited to have her in her new role. Um, in the near future, we'll begin recruiting for a staff services manager for the enforcement unit. Um, as you may know, the previous enforcement manager, El Sabara, has been appointed as the assistant executive officer of the board um, and has been doing double duty while we try to finish out some of those previous recruitments. Um, and a special thanks to her for that. I've certainly benefited from having her as the AEO. And all the while, while she's assisting me in those duties, she's maintained her role as the enforcement manager. So um, I thank you to Elsa for that. Um, as staff have transitioned to a 75% telework schedule, um, which means we have about seven to 10 staff in the office on any given day, um, the admin unit has helped in, the, in that regard as well, providing staff with the necessary equipment and support for those working from home. Um, and all of this, um, while we've also successfully relocated to our new suite, um, which I'll provide an update on in just a moment. Um, the admin unit has, be help, has been helpful in so many countless ways, taking care of staff's needs, keeping our budget balanced, providing insight into fiscal impacts on legislation and regulation. Um, admin can be a very behind the scenes unit and as such can be a bit of a thankless job. And so I'd just like to recognize them for their services and say thank you. Um, the next item in my report is board member appointments. And I'm happy to formally announce the appointment of two members. Um, Jonathan Irvin of Lancaster was appointed as a public member by the Speaker of the Assembly, Anthony Rendon. Dale Armstrong was appointed as a professional member by the Governor. Both members have had experience with our board meetings, but this is their first full board meeting, so I'd like to say welcome to the PTBC. 
Um, thank you for your service, and we are very excited to have you. I'd also like to formally recognize the reappointment of two of our members. Um, Dr. Alicia Rubina Amen has been reappointed as a professional member by the governor. And Katerina Ellaby has been reappointed as a public member by the governor. And I'd like to say welcome back, and also thank you for your service as well. And we have a full board. We actually have seven members, and we will for quite, for quite some time. So um, we're very happy about that. Um, next item on my report is PTBC re relocation. Um, we're about 85% done with our relocation, and that percentage is probably going to change back and forth over time as I reassess. Um, COVID-19 has definitely made an already hard task of moving harder. Um, we still have some IT issues, or IT issues to work through. Um, we'll be transitioning to a new phone system as well as a new printing network. Um, as part of our move in November and December, we plan on implementing a new filing system um, purchased from the California Prison Industry Authority. And like a lot of things with COVID-19 um, and many things in our own move, um, COVID-19 created a delay there as well. Um, we're currently utilizing our old filing system, uh, and we just received notice that we can expect our new filing equipment in mid-May. Um, as just kind of a general note, uh, I would like to thank all of my staff for their ability to acclimate to this um, current climate and situation. Um, they've made my job much easier. Uh, I know that there's a certain solace that things are still getting done. There are really no backlogs to measure at this point, and that is uh, highly commendable. The fact that they're able to maintain the status quo on business as usual, even during this global pandemic, is, a, is an amazing task. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. Any uh, board member questions or comments? I actually have a question. Um, congratulations to Julie Thau, and she's been very helpful um, for board members. And with her new position, um, will she be changing duties very much? or? That's a good point. Julie has um, been doing a number of the um, board member liaison duties for some time, which I think makes her a perfect candidate for that promotion. Um, but her duties will will be changing in the in the sense that she'll be centralized to those duties that, as a, a concierge, if you will, for the board members and um, board meeting planning and those kind of things. Some of the other duties that. Um, she currently has will be taken off her plate once we find once we find her office technician um, replacement. Okay. And uh, you mentioned that um, Delta Barra has been very helpful as AEO, but also wearing the enforcement hat. So two questions on that. Um, one, if you can kind of give us an idea of how she lessened your load or helped out a little bit, and then also. Um, when do you think the search for the enforce her replacement in enforcement will come about? The the enforcement manager recruitment will take about three months, start to finish. Um, we plan on starting it um, first week of April, so I would imagine that position being um, filled by July. Mm -hmm. um, how Elsa has helped me. Um, all three of my managers have kind of acted as an assistant executive officer until capacity up to this point anyway. Um, but Elsa has made it possible for the PTBC to be in two places at one time. And so when there are scheduling conflicts um, where we may have a meeting, as an example with DCA and a meeting with the legislature at the same time, um, I can attend the legislative meeting while Elsa attends the DCA meeting on our behalf. Um, in case review and working as the complainant in the enforcement unit, um, Elsa has been much more involved in the deliberations when it comes to what the final decision or outcome is with staff. And so, so those, some of those cases that might result in citation or um, in-house public letter of reprimand recommendations can be handled at her level, which frees me up a little bit to deal with some of the more um, complex cases. And so I, that's the part where I certainly appreciate that. Um, the other part comes from just the teleworking schedule itself. 
right? So where we mentioned that staff, are, there's only about seven to 10 staff in the office on any given day. Um, the days that Elsa is here that I'm not, there's an executive decision maker, you know, in the house, which has provided conveniences that are almost too abundant to list at this point. But, um, and then there are days where she and I are both here together. And so that has assisted um, very well. Thank you. Um, I know that board members were passionate about getting um, an AEO on board and getting that support. So I just want to invite our um, board members for comment at this time. Madam President. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Jason, if it might be possible to produce a, a, a listing of the positions that we currently have and who's in them, and potentially just a few short word, uh, a short summary of what their duties are. Um, this is something that we've had, I've kind of sort of figured out along the way as I've been going and hearing people's names and then trying to get a feel for where they fit. But I think it as, especially as an orientation kind of thing, I think it might be really helpful for our new board members, um, but even for some of the more veteran board members where positions are changing, people shift uh, to different positions within within the office. I think it would be really helpful to, to have that information. Agreed, I think that's a, an excellent idea. We'd be happy to provide that. Further board comments? And moderator, can you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, this is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, moving on to agenda item number 10 regarding waivers. So I'll go ahead and draw the board's attention to the three most recent extensions for waivers issued by the director of BCA. Uh, the first uh, waiver is DCA 21117, which is the fifth extension. And this extension um, tempor temporarily extends the waiver of the continuing competency renewal requirements for licensees until March 31st. Um, and licensees must complete their continuing competency requirements within six months of the date of the order. The next uh, waiver, DCA 21-122, is the fifth extension which temporarily waives the requirement for a licensee to con conduct um, in-person patient examination and evaluation as required by BPC 2620.1, subdivision A4, subject to the condition that examination and evaluation must be performed via electronic means. And this order temp uh, terminates on April 30th, 2021, unless further extended. And the third extension um, is DCA 21107, um, and this um, extension temporarily waives PT and PTA applicants whose applications are deemed denied without prejudice between February 1st, 2021 and April 2nd, 2021, um, due to an applicant failing to take and pass the examinations prescribed by the board. Um, just want to invite uh, staff comment, um, Mr. Kaiser, if you have anything to add on this. Sure. Um, for all three of those um, extensions of waivers, the only thing that I would bring to the board's attention and to keep in mind is that we're close to expiration on all three. Um, and there is kind of a constant conversation going on between the boards and the Department of Consumer Affairs Director um, as to what further extensions might be necessary. Um, for all three, for the continuing education, I could see that one being extended um, 
where it affects PTPC because it will be extended department-wide over all the health quality boards. Um, I don't know now um, in our current situation that it's all that necessary because some of those courses that weren't being provided are starting to be provided. Some of the access to those courses is starting to return. Um, so I think that one may be extended, but again, I think it's extended as just a, um, a result of the mechanic for maybe some of the other boards. Um, the if I could ask, it, sorry, if I could ask a question specifically related to the continuing education extension. Um, because it, it's not totally clear to me as to whether the extension means that licensees who are required to renew between March 31st of last year of 2020 and now March 20, March 31st of 2021 or whatever ultimate date that the extensions go to, do they have six months from the expiration of all of the extensions in order to complete their, co their continuing competency? Or is it just that they have an additional six months from the end of that particular phase? So the current extension says is applies to licensees, uh, licenses who expire between March 1st and March 31st. And I'm assuming that's March 1st and March 31st of 2021. So is it only that group that now has an additional, has the extension for six months? Or does it apply to all the way back to the beginning of uh, the um, the waiver for everybody that they will have an additional six months from the end of March thirty of March thirty one of this year? You follow? I do. It's an excellent question. It's one that we've addressed um, times because the language is, I won't say confusing, but not quite clear as to how it um, pertains from one waiver extension to another. Um, if, in looking at the spirit of the waiver, for those folks that expired in March of last year, um, if we had only extended it for six months for them, but then also found it necessary to extend those that were expiring in October another six months because there is limited access or ability to attend courses, um, the way we've interpreted that language is essentially that those folks that expired last March in 2020 now have a year and six months extension because there has been a limited ability to attend those courses. Um, so we see the expiration being effective off of the last extension. And so for everyone that was from March to April of this year, will not only have um, the extension off of their own renewal um, expiration, but they'll also have six months from April 1. Thank you. That was, that was what my understanding was, but I know that there's been confusion um, from, other, from my colleagues, uh, from other PTs who've been asking, how, does, how is this all working? Yeah, thank you. And, and, when I, and when I provide that explanation, I provide it for the PTBC. That waiver is, um, is going to be interpreted by other boards and bureaus. Um, but we're looking at, at the intent of the general waiver. And like I said, it would be unfair to um, require those that expired in March of 2020 to provide continuing competency proof when continuing competency was being waived for the folks six months later as well. So for us, that six months is just that rolling extension. And to great credit to continuing education, continuing competency providers um, who traditionally do face-to-face in-person courses, the, the adaptation to being able to use online, some sort of an integrative online format to be able to get Con Ed, get continuing competency um, components out to the licensees has been has been really remarkable. It has. We've seen um, a large influx of, of interest in becoming a recognized approval agency as well. And so some of the content providers that were seeking recognition from other recognized approval agencies 
may be having some of those same difficulties with transitioning from in-person classes to online classes and so have sought, you know, becoming providers and approval agencies themselves to kind of lessen the load, if you will. So um, the, one, the one thing I would say about the continuing education waiver that is kind of important for the board members to know is that it effectively makes it impossible to audit continuing education for that period of time. Um, and I really won't be able to provide you with an update until I know the continuing education waiver has expired. You know, once that expiration has actually come and gone, we can start to formulate a plan on how to go about catching up on audits. Um, because again, if they, if somebody had expired in March of last year or April of last year, our analysts are going to have to look at a much larger period of time that they could have come into compliance. Right, so instead of a two year renewal period, effectively now it's a three and a half year renewal period that they could have come into compliance. Um, but uh, once we know, once that waiver has actually expired and no longer affects the continuing competency audit process, um, we'll provide an update on how we're going to um, go about catching up. Thank you for that. Um, additionally, because it looks like we may have a number of uh, new participants uh, in this meeting. Um, it might be helpful to review the the process uh, that individuals make sure when they when they do renew their license that they do still check the box uh, to indicate that they have complied. Um, but it there's because there's questions still popping up around. Well, I haven't done my con ed or I haven't had that available. Sure. Um, excellent point because it's something that we, we answer to in correspondence and phone calls almost on a daily basis at this point. So if you're a licensee um, and you fit within that date range and it's time for you to renew and you get to your renewal coupon or maybe renewing online with Breeze and you get to that point where we ask you, are you in compliance with the continuing competency regulations? And your answers potentially are yes or I would like to select inactive status because essentially we don't want you to um, put your license in jeopardy. So you have one choice or the other. Um, because of the waiver, you can in good faith answer yes, you are in compliance with the continuing competency um, questions about compliance with the regulation because of the waiver. At the time you answered the question, there was a waiver in place and so you had an extension in time. Um, effectively some six months and for some as we've discussed up to a year and a half. Um, so you can answer yes you are. I would just you know caution and um, uh, as a point of clarity please ensure that you are or you do become compliant within that period of time. Right. So um, when we do return to audits because there's a, effectively a potentially a year and a half for some folks to renew um, and come into compliance with continuing competency, we may not be very lenient for those folks who weren't in compliance at that point and maybe did it within 17 months or 18 months or something like that. Um, because you know enough time has been given as a, as an accommodation to the licensee through this director's waiver. Um, that we feel like continuing competency should not drop off the radar. It's still extremely important and we still want people to comply. Um, follow through, right? And keep in mind that you attested under penalty of perjury through that question that you were in compliance and now you have a commitment to stay in compliance um, through the, the expiration of that waiver. Thank you. Um, and then just one other follow up to that is are there uh, plain English um, formats of these descriptions being posted uh, for the public, for uh, in the, for licensees to be able to look up more readily, um, either on our uh, social media platforms or on the website? All of the waiver information is posted on the board's website. Um, the ones that pertain to physical therapists and physical therapist assistants. Um, your description of plain English is something that we kind of try to steer away from because legalese is legalese. And when we try to um, put it in a, a frame of plain English, 
might lose some detail and provide bad advice to those licensees. So um, we're happy to describe it. We're happy to discuss it and inform our licensing population, but to translate it into, I don't know if you would like to call it layman's terms or, or what have you, um, the waivers are what the waivers are. So we can interpret it. We just can't interpret it on paper. Non-legalese. Correct. Thank you. That just helps to address another question that I've received. So thank you. Any other board comments? For the, for the other two waivers, the second waiver, especially the direct access waiver, I could certainly see that waiver being extended as it provides a, a, a relief to consumers. Um, the ability to receive services through direct access, through a direct access method um, without having to be bogged down by an in-person um, review by a physician or surgeon. So um, in conversations with the director, that's certainly one that we've advocated for to be extended. Um, until the emergency order is lifted. Um, the third waiver, as it applies to applicants and the ability to take examinations, um, I don't know that that one is going to be extended. The National Physical Therapy Examination really hasn't been uh, sidelined, if you will, or delayed, if you will, by the, by the global pandemic. It, it was very early on, but now um, there are booking appointments, they're going into prometric centers and taking their examinations. Um, and there's very little delay, there's very little difficulty in attending um, their first choice of testing facility or what have you. So um, again, it might be one of those things where it's extended um, for us as a result of also other applicants in the Department of Consumer Affairs being extended, but I don't know that it's necessary so much for our stakeholders to have that extension done. Any other board comment on any of the waivers, of extended waivers? So, um, Madam President, my, my apologies. Um, just to provide uh, contrast uh, for clarification um, for the second uh, waiver, which addresses the need to have, uh, for direct access, to have a physician um, visit within uh, now, that can be done um, electronically rather than the in-person. The intent is not for that time period to extend, or the intent is not for the board to interpret that that time period extends from the initial start of the waiver. So that there's not a, re that the requirement for within 60 days doesn't still applies to within 60 days doesn't mean that from march of 2020 oh i have another six i get another 60 days to wait until a patient goes to see a, or has a physician visit whether in person or electronic correct correct it shouldn't be it should not be interpreted as an extension of time just an extension of access meaning that the review can be done electronically instead of in person with that physician or surgeon as long as the order is in effect. Thank you. Okay, any other board comment or question? I'm gonna pause here just for a moment to give you time to turn on your mic. Okay, moderator, will you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment, please type, I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. This is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? 
Yes, please. Thank you. OK, you're welcome. And agenda item number 11, uh, Consumer and Professional Association and Intergovernmental Relations Report. Um, I don't think we have um, a representative from FSBPT here, but anything to report on FSBPT, uh, Mr. Kaiser? Nothing in particular. Um, we have been attending um, frequent trainings that FSBPT has provided, um, kind of in lieu of their leadership issues forum, things that we would normally attend in person, but because of COVID-19, um, where we might do it in a single weekend and attend six or seven classes, um, we have now kind of stretched them out month after month. And so um, about once a month, we've attended a, a one to two hour WebEx provided by FSBPT um, to prepare us for the delegate assembly coming towards the end of the year. Okay. Um, forgive me for forgetting the last name of the FSBPT um, legal counsel, Dale. Yes. Um, he's a, a wonderful speaker with a lot of knowledge on regulatory issues. And I'm just wondering, I, I've seen his name come across mm -hmm. some of those trainings. And so um, usually we do try and work in a training for board members and, and the public during our board meetings. And I'm wondering if you've come across one from him in particular, because I just thought he was so dynamic and um, knowledgeable. Maybe we can use one of his trainings in the future. We are going to attempt to. Um, the last training that he provided as part of the Leadership Issues Forum was, was lengthy. Mm -hmm. It was about a four-hour training. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but one of the things that we've thought about is trying to have him provide something that is California-specific. Mm -hmm. um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll be talking to FSCBT about that. Um, but that last training, while I think it was really valuable, I don't know that I could ask you guys to, you know, sit through four hours of a, a virtual WebEx. Um, there may be opportunity in the future if he is to do another that might be a little bit shorter, and if that's the case, that's certainly something that I would like to bring as a training component at a future meeting. Okay. Yeah, I think I've seen, I don't know if the other board members are getting emails from FSBPT, but I think I've seen a couple um, that he specifically was um, doing the, the time frame just didn't fit for my schedule, but um, there might be some shorter ones. I would, I would in, encourage highly if you have an opportunity to sit in on a training that he teaches, um, they're very good. Okay. Thank you. And agenda item 11B, DCA. Do we have a DCA representative here for us today? Hi, good morning, Board President Rubina, Amen, and Board members. I'm Carrie Holmes. Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Relations at the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to provide a department update to the board. I would like to welcome Dale Armstrong and Jonathan Irvin as the newest members of the board. Congratulations on your appointments and thank you so much for your willingness to serve. COVID-19 does continue to impact every aspect of our work. DCA offices remain open with preventative measures to safeguard the health and safety of employees and visitors. DCA and its boards and bureaus are maximizing telework to reduce risk for all employees. Public health measures such as distancing, face covering, and frequent hand washing are required for employees who cannot telework. I encourage everyone to visit DCA's COVID-19 website, which is frequently updated with information including vaccine distribution, economic relief for licensees and small businesses, and the latest public health guidance. DCA is pleased to announce that on January 12th, Governor Newsom appointed Monica Vargas as Deputy Director of Communications at DCA. Monica has been an information officer at the Governor's Office of Emergency Services since 2015. She was also an information officer at DCA from 2013 to 2015. She joined DCA last month and has hit the ground running. On February 2nd, Governor Newsom appointed Sarah Murillo as Deputy Director of Administrative Services at DCA. Ms. Murillo has gained a wide range of experience in her nearly 20 years of service to all Californians in various state departments, including California Complete Count Census 2020. Ms. Murillo comes to DCA with a skill set that makes her well suited to support all the entities within the department. Her appointment fills the final vacancy in DCA's executive office, and DCA is so pleased that she has joined us. I'd like to remind board members that Form 700 filings are due by April 1, 2021. You as board members are designated appointees and required to complete a Statement of Economic Interest Form 700 
even if you have no reportable interest. If you have any questions about how to file, you may speak to the department's conflict of interest officer, Jill Johnson, in DCA Office of Human Resources. Additionally, 2021 is a mandatory sexual harassment prevention, prevention training year. This means all employees and board members are required to complete the training during the year. Finally, I'd like to let you know about two exciting new initiatives launched by DCA Director Kirkmeyer for 2021 to enhance DCA services to all boards and bureaus. The first is the Enlightened Licensing Project. This work group was formed to utilize licensing subject matter experts within the entire department. The group helps individual boards and bureaus streamline and make their licensing processes more effective and efficient by utilizing best practices, information technology, and cost-saving measures. The second is an executive officer cabinet. This group of board and bureau executives maintains regular communication, provides feedback and information to DCA, and assists with special projects that will impact all boards and bureaus. You will not be surprised to learn that executive officer Jason Kaiser is part of the cabinet. DCA always appreciates his willingness to step up and serve as a leader among his peers. Before I close, DCA would like to say thank you to board staff who have been working so hard to maintain excellent customer service through these challenging times. In fact, DCA recently featured the PTBC in the Did You Know newsletter as an example of going above and beyond to serve the public. DCA received a thank you letter from a student who is struggling through the pandemic. Through the administrative help of PTBC staff, he was able to resolve his test scheduling challenges and ultimately was successful in obtaining licensure. His message concluded, because of this experience, I've made a personal, personal commitment to continually pay it forward as much as I can and will represent the physical therapy profession to the best of my ability. Thank you all for serving. You do make a difference. As always, Board and Bureau Relations is here to help, and if there is anything we can do to assist, please reach out. This concludes my presentation, and I'll hand it back over to Board President Rebita Amen. Thank you for that wonderful report, Carrie. And I'll just give board members a moment to unmute and um, give you a chance to comment or have any questions. And if you do, just jump right in. I'll, I'll say that um, I recently attended um, the board member orientation training, and I think Ms. Ellaby did as well. And uh, it was definitely improved since the last time that I attended. And I, I think DCA did a wonderful job incorporating all of the elements that are really pertinent to um, what a board member should know. And so um, thank you for those improvements and that great training. I also attended the president's training, which I think was the first time there was a president's training. Um, yes, and that was very helpful as well. Helpful to know that there are some things that we're doing well here um, as board members and then some things that we might be able to improve upon and incorporate. So. Um, thank you to DCA leadership and all of DCA for providing these trainings. There's also been an inclusion of um, the board president and vice president in invitation to the board leadership meetings with DCA, and that's very much appreciated as well. I can say that each time I attend something, I come away with um, more uh, pearls to utilize here at the board. So uh, just want to make sure that you get that feedback um, that it, it is very helpful what DCA leadership is providing to the board members. Thank you. I'll pass that along. And any other board comment or question? And any comment from board staff? I would echo that sentiment. I think um, I attended the, the board member orientation training um, for the first time in a long time and could definitely see an improvement in that training as well. Um, and the president's training was something that I think I agree with Madam President. There is definitely a few things there that um, we took away as to do's in the future. So we appreciate that very much. So I would, I would um, thank very strongly um, Ms. Holmes for her contributions to those kind of things because 
I don't think that there, it's coincidental that with the change in directorship and in uh, board and bureau relations that those things are happening the way they are. So thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Okay, and we're going to move to agenda item number 11C, uh, CPTA, oh, I'm sorry. Public um, Should we do it after every sub letter or at the end? My apologies, go ahead. That's okay. Okay, so 11C, the CPTA report. Moderator, there may be somebody in the queue from CPTA, and if that's the case, if you would promote them to panelists. Um, thank, thank you, this is the moderator, and I'm looking at my list of meeting participants, and I'm not sure who I should be looking for. Either um, Stacy Defoe or Tamika Island. Okay. We have Stacy. Stacy, you've now been made a panelist. And I believe we have Tamika as well. So, Tamika, I promoted you. So, uh, Tamika and Stacy, you both now are panelists and can unmute yourself at will. And if you're unsure how to do that, you should see a mic at the bottom middle of your screen. If you click it, it turns green. There we go. It looks like Stacy, you're unmuted. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I was having having trouble finding that how to unmute. Um, I'm my name is Stacy Defoe. I'm executive director for the California Physical Therapy Association. Um, I'm here representing CPTA today. Um, just wanted to give you a couple updates on um, where we are um, this year so far. Um, the CPTA office remains open and has remained open and um, working hard um, over the past year. Um, we, we are following state COVID guidelines. We are um, working partially remotely, um, partially in the office. We stagger schedules so that we're not all there at the same time. Um, wear face masks and wash hands, all those, all those wonderful things that we're, we've all been doing this year. And, um, and we're using a virtual format for most um, for everything um, now and, and at least, you know, planning through the end of the year, um, we're using virtual format for um, all of our um, meetings, committee meetings, um, and education. And um, we are, we will be, I think, as James mentioned earlier, um, using the virtual format again this year for our annual conference. Um, our annual conference will, will be held um, October 9th and 10th. Um, and this year, yes, um, we're, we are planning for a number of reasons to, to stay in a virtual format, um, but we do plan to be back in person, um, fingers crossed, all those things. Um, next year in Anaheim um, for a face-to-face -face conference, September 24th and 25th, um, 2022. Um, we have been busy, um, just like you all have, even though we're in um, a virtual format working remotely. Um, we still have a lot going on um, in the office and um, for, our, for um, PTs in California, we, um, we did have a, P, a, legislative, a PT legislative week um, instead of a day. Uh, that was the week of March 8th. Um, we had more than 100 PTs um, registered for a virtual event that we held on that Monday, March 8th. And then we held virtual uh, meetings with legislators throughout the week. Um, Assemblymember Jordan Cunningham attended the event. Um, he's the author of a bill that we're sponsoring this year, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And it was a great event. Um, and we were, we were happy that we were still able to um, continue with the event and, and hold it for a number of our members and schedule those meetings, which um, turned out to, to work very well. Um, most of, as you all know, um, the, the legislature is meeting mostly for, via Zoom as well, and so we were able to um, utilize that and meet with, with a number of them. Um, we held our student conclave March 20th. Um, we want to thank Jason, um, Sarah, and April for participating, and um, we know that you've been busy um, 
meeting with all the schools and reaching out to them over the past year because it sounded like they felt like they were already um, advised <laughs> on everything. So I think that's a testament to the work that you've already done um, that um, they they felt like they could they could go on and do um, other things during that day. But we do appreciate you being there and participating. Um, and then we are continuing our um, virtual education throughout this year. We're actually um, doing quite a lot. We have webinar Wednesdays um, where we have um, we have education provided just about every Wednesday, um, usually in the evening. Um, we're continuing with now we have um, the ability to do virtual um, CCI courses and um, a, a few um, weekend courses now that we'll be doing virtually as well, um, as well as a PT Pain Summit again in November. Um, see, we are sponsoring a bill this year. Um, we've introduced a bill. Um, it's designed to increase patient access to physical therapists um, by strengthening laws that govern decision making and transparency by health plans, insurers, and third party administrators. The bill is eight. AB 1468, um, it addresses practices by health plans um, in which they um, are using automated systems based on algorithms to make determinations. Um, they do this early on and it requires a number of, um, sort of red tape steps early on in um, the episode of care that um, those, um, they create delays for the patient. Um, so this bill takes on that practice by saying um, that if these health plans are going to use algorithms, um, they, they must be transparent and accessible, and that the utilization review needs to be done by a healthcare practitioner licensed in the state. Um, and then it, it's going to um, not allow plans to um, set up prior authorization hurdles during the initial 12 visits related to every new episode of care. Um, there is no efficiency in plans jumping in earlier. National data shows an average of 12 visits per episode of care. Um, and I, I bring this up now. Um, it's not currently um, on the agenda um, during the, through the legislative um, portion of the agenda. So I, I bring it up now during our um, update, but we can talk about it more during that, during that legislative part of the agenda if you would like. Um, I'm not sure what your preference would be there. Now would be okay. Okay. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's fine, Stacy. Okay, great. And um, we do have um, some support. We've built a, co a coalition of support um, from, we just recently received pro uh, support from CMA. Um, we have support from Kairos, um, occupational therapists. Um, we've been in discussions with the um, California Hospital Association um, and other groups, and then we'll be moving on to looking for support from um, consumer groups as well. Um, and we would um, ask if the board could consider um, looking at this uh, bill and possibly um, supporting as well. Um, since it's not on the agenda currently, I'm not sure if that'll be able to happen at this meeting, but um, possibly it could be added to a subsequent meeting. Um, the bill is going to go to the Assembly Health Committee. Um, it's looking like it'll be the first two weeks of April. Um, that'll be its first stop. We don't have a date yet. Um, so we are activating our grassroots um, starting now. And um, I guess I will stop there and ask if there are any questions on the bill from the board. That actually ends, ends our update, so this would be a good time. Board members, feel free to unmute your mic and jump right in. Any questions or comments from the staff? Um, we will add AB 1468 um, to the summary in the future and provide an analysis of the bill at the June meeting. Um, and so at that point, the board may have an opportunity to um, choose a position of support. 
That sounds good. Thank you. All right, that's it for us. Thanks for thanks for having us. Thank you, Stacy. Okay, and so I'm um, hearing no further board comment or discussion. Uh, Moderator Reed, please facilitate comment on 11A, B, or C. Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any members of the public would like to comment on those items, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. All right, this is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, um, it's 1010. I think we have time to maybe get in um, agenda item number 12 before having a, a break if needed. And we have DCA budget unit, uh, unit uh, Karen Munoz and Sarah Hinkle. This is uh, Renee Milano. I'm actually going to be taking over uh, the PT budget management position. Um, I've recently moved to the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, and I apologize. Unfortunately, Karen wasn't able to attend. She was initially going to be providing the presentation. Okay, no problem. Would you please introduce yourself again? It's a little bit low. We just want to make sure we can hear you. Absolutely. Um, my name is Renee Milano. Um, I've recently moved to the Department of Consumer Affairs and I'm one of the budget managers at our budget office. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. And so just to start us off, um, I just wanted to let you know that I'll be providing just a general overview. Some of the fiscal information will be provided later in the meeting, a lot more detailed information. And so I'm hoping to just provide a general overview of sort of the budget process and then just a few of the services that the budget unit provides. And so just to start over, uh, start my explanation with a general overview of sort of who we are and what services we provide. Um, we do provide basically annual budget facilitation. And so as the budget office, our main role is to facilitate the annual budget process for the department and for all the boards and bureaus, including PT. And so just to start us off with what the budget process is, the budget process is really the statewide process of how a budget is developed and ultimately enacted into law. Um, this is for state departments and it's to adhere to an uh, on an annual basis. And so something important to note is that um, this is based off of fiscal year. So July 1st to June 30th. And I just wanted to also state, I know we have two new board members, so I was just going to go through a couple of the stages of the budget process and just give a general overview just to give them that extra background. Um, and so we primarily deal with the three main stages. And so these three main stages are basically stage one, uh, which is the development of the governor's budget or our full process. Uh, stage two, which is the enactment of the budget act or what I like to call our spring process. And then stage three, which is basically the implementation of the budget. And so something that's important to note is that we do build a year ahead. And so, for example, in stage one during the development, we are building for the year ahead of that, not the current year. And so this is stage one is going to be based off of our incremental budget. And that's using a baseline. And it's sort of a baseline to start building from what our original previous year information is and then using budget letters and the like to basically increase or adjust as needed. And some of those typical adjustments are sort of um, based on salary and benefits, which is an annual item we, we tend to do every year, and then budget change proposals. Um, and that's something that I'm hoping um, everyone's semi-familiar with. Um, stage two moves towards the enactment of the Budget Act, or uh, again, our spring process. And that's when the governor's budget basically is released on January 10th, and that's a hard date. They're supposed to release that every January 10th. And some of the typical, typical activity that happens during stage two basically is we, the budget office, will assist the administration basically um, walking through the legislate, walking the legislator through our various adjustments that are being proposed. 
And so, for example, we would help the board explain their budget change proposals if there is a proposal submitted that year. And so once this portion is completed, um, the legislature will approve and sign and then it will move into our stage three and basically become our budget act. And so the physical therapy board, PT board, is supported by one fund, and that's the physical therapy fund or fund 0759. And this is basically where all of our authorized expenditures are being made from. This will be the, fu the primary fund source. And so the board, the board appropriation is what is approved in the annual budget act. And so it's just, it's really important to remember boards are expressly prohibited from making expenditures in excess to their annual appropriations. And so board members do have a fiduciary responsibility to ensure that the board maintains uh, their expenditures within the authorized appropriations. And so a good way to do that is to basically review budget reports and expenditures on a routine basis. And a lot of these items are things that the budget office and the accounting office help resource out to um, PT to assist them in their tracking. And so moving on from there, another really good tool is our fund conditions. And so that's something the budget unit does specifically assist the board with helping get all the information necessary to help them do their projections and methodologies through there. And so fund conditions and expenditures, basically the fund, the board's fund condition expenditure projections document are just a really vital tool to be used by board members and it helps them monitor expenditures and revenue. And what's nice about it is it helps weigh in on any potential fiscal decisions the board may need to make. And so for fund conditions, one way that it's displayed or how it is displayed is using fiscal years and then estimated portions of the revenue, expenditures and fund balance. And so a good way to use that is it's a monitoring, it, it allows us to monitor and project future health of funds. And it kind of assists us in determining if a fee increase may be needed or an, in some rare cases, a decrease. Um, it helps us identify if there's a declining fund balance. And then a really good tool we use in here is also our months in reserve. And that's a really good tracking mechanism for a lot of our funds. And the months in reserve is basically, it's a metric and it takes the, the ending fund balance for a specific fiscal year and compares it to the board's total authorized expenditures. And that provides the total months a fund could sustain operations, assuming no additional revenue is being collected. And so, for example, a fund with a 12 month in reserve could essentially sustain operations for a full year without any revenue being collected in addition to what is already in reserves. Another tool we do um, help and assist providing resources for is our projections. And projections are basically a tool that's used to monitor expenditures and revenue throughout the fiscal year. And this assists in making a lot of the finan financial decisions as well. And what's nice about the projections is that this is updated on a monthly basis and is provided regularly or as requested um, to the board. And so the budget reports um, that are provided to board members give an opportunity to see how the board is expending its funds and all the expenses broken out into categories. And this will include categories such as salary, benefits, facility operations is a common one we'll, we'll be tracking on there and equipment. And that's just to name a few. And so um, this was just a general, again, a general overview of sort of the budget process and what the budget unit kind of assists and helps with. But there will be, again, a more detailed overview of, you know, the, an actual fund condition and how the board's um, currently tracking all of their current expenditures. But we just wanted to make sure to just provide just a, a small presentation of our services. Um, I am available if you have any questions. And thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I did want to reiterate, too, um, just to assure everyone on the board, I know we do have two new members. It, the board is in a really good spot. The fund is healthy. We have no, no outstanding issues in any way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. Um, board members, I'll give you a moment just to unmute your mic. Do you have any questions or comments? And any comments from board staff? Nothing in, in particular. I'd just like to thank um, the budget unit for um, 
providing this kind of information. I, I did not give them very much of a, a, a notice to make this presentation. So, um, you know, thank you to um, Sarah and Renee and uh, Robert De Los Reyes, the, the officer over the unit. Um, they help us tremendously when it comes down to trying to figure out the best way to go about spending our money um, and making sure that that fund condition stays healthy over the long haul. Great. And speaking as a board member, I, I appreciate your report, Renee. Um, as a board member, we're not in the daily know of what's going on, and so having some perspective and some education is, is always helpful. And um, you know, good to point that arrow to uh, months in reserve for us board members. So uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much for running that down. And um, I'd like to ask the moderator to facilitate any public comment, please. Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please type I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. This is a moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, it's 1020. I think it might be a good stopping point for 10 minutes to take a break. So um, if we could take a break while well, now it's 1021, let's come back right at 1031 and we'll pick up with agenda item number 13. Hello, it is 10.32. We're back from a short recess, and um, I'd like to have a roll call vote, please. Alicia Vinay Men, I'm here. Katerina Ellaby. Present. Gail Armstrong. Present. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Uh, Daniel Drummer. Present. Jonathan Irvin. Present. Tanya McMillian? Present. All members are present with the exception of Jesus Dominguez and the board has a quorum. Thank you. Okay, and so um, usually when we're in person, it's easy just to kind of look down the row and um, you know see if there is a board member who would like to make a comment or um, sometimes the board president will actually invite uh, board members by name to make a comment. and. It's difficult to do that uh, virtually, so I just want to uh, encourage our board members. I know it's a little different format than being in person, but please feel free to just unmute and ask any questions or make any comments as we go along. Um, we are on agenda item number 13, which is our legislation report. So there are currently 2,000 um, 2,572 bills introduced for this legislative session. 1,692 are in the Assembly and 880 in the Senate. Last year for uh, 2020, there were 2,223 bills introduced in both the Senate and Assembly. Um, 137 Senate bills made it to the governor's desk and 117 were signed and 20 were vetoed. 
And in the assembly, 291 bills made it to the governor's desk and 255 were signed and 36 were vetoed. As noted on the attached legislative calendar in the materials, uh, February 19th was the last day for bills to be introduced. The legislature does go into spring recess tomorrow, March 25th, and they will reconvene on April 5th. September 3rd is the last day for bills to be amended on the floor, and September 10th is the last day for each house to pass bills. October 10th is the last day for the governor to sign or veto bills in his possession by September 10th, and all statutes will take effect on January 1st, 2022. I'll go ahead and go through each bill on the legislative summary and provide a detailed update and synopsis. The legislative summary begins on page 56 of the meeting materials. And the first bill um, noted on there is AB 29, State Bodies Meetings. This bill is very similar to a bill from last legislative session. This bill would require that, the, that all the writings and materials provided for the notice meeting be made available on the board's website or to any person who requests materials in writing on the same day of the dismissment, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> of the, um, let me start that over, um, request the materials in writing on the same day that they are disseminated to the members or at least 72 hours in advance of the meeting, whichever is earlier. So it would prohibit the board from discussing any writings or materials or from taking action on an item unless the board has complied with the above provisions and those outlined in the bill. Um, this bill is still um, currently in the Assembly Committee on Governmental Organization. Were there any questions on this bill, members? Brooke, this is Daniel Dormer. Mm -hmm. um, could you just refresh our memory about what happened to uh, the bill, the similar bill um, presented the last time? Yes, I believe this bill... Um, uh, died in the second house a few, a few weeks before the deadline. So again, last session, um, we're going to see a lot of bills from last session kind of reappear this uh, session just because of um, a lot of the bills from last session weren't um, put forth um, due to, you know, uh, urgency because of COVID and the pandemic. So um, we don't have any specific reason as to why it didn't make it through, why it didn't make it out of committee at this point? No, no, okay. no not at this point, no. Um, and I believe there's about, I think, six or seven bills that uh, were uh, put forth very similar to the last amended version from last uh, legislative session 2020 um, that we're gonna see in the same um, form um, as they were introduced in this session. At the close of the, the last legislative session, we were kind of at the height of the pandemic. So the prior presentation by the legislature really was about emergency services and all those things related to COVID. So there was a, uh, a guidance given out, if you will, from uh, both the Senate and the Assembly and the governor's office that to the authors of bills to please reconsider um, submitting bills that aren't COVID related or at the same time, please don't, you know, get your feelings hurt that a bill is not going to make it very far because right now we've diverted all of our resources to those kind of emergent um, issues. So we, you know, we expect it to be quite a few of these bills be in this session. And then just a, um, a question. We, we, so the prior session was 19 to 20, and so we are now into a new two-year cycle, new two-year session, correct? Correct. Thank you. Okay, the next bill on the legislative summary is AB 54, COVID-19 emergency order violation, license revocation. And this bill would prohibit, prohibit DCA, a board within DCA, and the Department of Beverage Control from revoking a license for failure to comply with any COVID-19 emergency order unless the board can prove that the lack of compliance resulted in transmission of COVID-19. This bill is currently in the Assembly Business and Professions Committee and also in the Governmental Organizational Committee. Uh, 
the next bill on um, the list is AB 107, Licensure of Veterans and Military Spouses, and um, this bill would require boards within DCA to issue temporary licenses to applicants if they supply evidence that the applicant is an honor, honorably discharged veteran of the armed forces of the U.S. or is married to or in a domestic partnership or other legal union with an active duty member of the armed forces of the U.S. This bill is similar to another bill from last legislative session, and we did work with the author's office last year to get an exemption from that bill. And the exemption did carry over into this bill, so we would be exempt um, from the proposed provisions of this bill under BPC section um, 115.6, subdivision H. And this bill is currently in the Assembly Business and Professions Committee. And the next bill is um, AB 225, uh, DCA Board's Veterans Military Spouses Licenses, and it's, again, very similar to AB 3045 from last legislative session, which would require regulatory boards within DCA that do not currently grant temporary licenses to active duty military spouses and partners to issue a license to an applicant who is an honorably discharged veteran of the armed forces of the U.S., is the spouse or domestic partner of an active duty member of the armed forces of the U.S. who is assigned to a duty station in California under official active duty military orders and holds a current active and unrestricted license to practice in another state or district or territory of the United States in the profession or vocation for which the applicant seeks a license from the board. Um, and this bill is referred to the Business and Professions Committee and the Committee of, on Military and Veterans Affairs. And the next bill is AB 339, State and Local Government Open Meetings. And this bill would require all meetings, as defined in the bill, to include an opportunity for all persons to attend via a call-in option or an internet-based service option that provides closed captioning services and requires both a call-in and an internet-based service option to be provided to the public. It would also require instructions on how to attend the meeting via call-in or internet-based service to be posted online, along with the meeting and agenda in an easily accessible location at least 72 hours before all regular meetings and at least 24 hours before all special meetings. The bill would also require all meetings to provide the public with an opportunity to address the legislative body remotely via call-in or internet-based service as provided and, re and would require those persons commenting in a language other than English to have double the amount of time as those giving a comment in English if the time restrictions on public comment are utilized. Um, and I believe this bill is still currently um, pending referral. Um, Brooke? Mm -hmm. oh, this is Tanya McMillan. Just a, a clar correction, Christina Garcia, Christina is misspelled. She's just C R I S. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Um, were there any other questions on AB 339? I will move on to AB 646, uh, DCA Board's Expunged Convictions. Again, this. The bill is similar to a bill that was introduced last session, um, I believe it was AB 1616. Um, this bill would require programs under the DCA that post information on its website about a revoked license due to a criminal conviction to update or remove information about the revoked license within 90 days of the board receiving an expungement order related to the conviction. Um, and also, the person seeking the change would be required to pay um, the board a fee of $50 unless another amount is determined by the board. Um, which would be designed to cover the administrative costs of the requirements. And this bill is currently in the Assembly Business and Professions Committee. The next bill is AB 657, State Civil Service System Personal Services Contract Professionals. And this bill would prohibit a state agency from entering into a contract with a professional as defined in the bill for a period of more than 365 consecutive days or for a period of 365 non-consecutive days in a 24-month period. This bill would also define professional um, for these provisions to include, among others, physicians, dentists, psychologists, clinical social workers, and pharmacists. 
This bill would also require each state agency that has a contract with a professional pursuant to these provisions to prepare a monthly report to the exclusive bargaining representative for the professional. And this bill is currently in the Assembly Committee on Public Employment and Retirement. Um, SB 102, COVID-19 Emergency Order Violation License Revocation would prohibit the DCA, a board within DCA that does not regulate stealing arts licenses and the Department of Alcohol Beverage Control from revoking a license or imposing a fine or penalty for failure to comply with any COVID-19 state of emergency orders unless the department or board can prove the lack of compliance, can prove that lack of compliance resulted in transmissions of COVID-19. So this bill is similar to AB 54 that we discussed earlier. However, this bill has a provision that excludes healing arts boards from the bill. This bill is currently in the Senate Business and Professions Committee. And the last bill on the legislative summary is um, SB 772, um, Professions of Vocation Citations Minor Violations. And this bill would prohibit the assessment of an administrative fine for a minor violation and would specify that a violation shall be considered minor if it meets specified conditions including that the violation did not pose a serious health or safety threat and that there is no evidence that the violation was willful. And this bill is currently still on the Senate Business and Professions Committee. Were there any questions on any of the bills that were discussed in the legislative summary? Hearing none, moderator, will you please facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any members of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. And I see that Stacy DeFoe would like to make a comment. So Stacy, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And Stacy, you've been unmuted. So Stacy, you've been unmuted. Can you hear us? All right, so Stacy, if you're talking, we can't hear you, unfortunately. So what I'm gonna do is I'll take the next person, I'll come back to you. So our next person that would like to make a comment is James Sims. James, I'll let you know when you've been unmuted. And James, you've been unmuted. All right, so we're having a little difficulty here. Let me go back to Stacy. Stacy, you've been unmuted. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, wonderful. Okay, Thank great. you. <laughs> um, I just had I had a question and I want to go back to um, a question for the board regarding um, the AB AB 107 and um, I guess AB 225 um, I heard the discussion that um, PT was exempted from AB 107 and um, I don't know if that would also apply to AB 225, but I just wanted to ask um, if the board could provide some um, guidance or um, um, you know, just the explanation as to why um, PT would be excluded from that, just for our reference. Sure. Um, currently for AB 107, um, the predecessor to that bill in the last legislative session, we had a, a very lengthy and um, discussion with Veterans Affairs and CalVet. Um, and essentially what we were asking is that to be um, exempted from that bill because a temporary license issued for a military spouse might actually take longer than our current PTLA status. So for uh, a military expedite currently for somebody who comes through the application process, we can get them um, into the workforce much quicker utilizing physical therapy and license applicant status 
than going through the process of issuing a whole temporary license just to then turn around and issue a normal license. Um, we have not had that conversation yet with AB 225 to get that exemption, um, but that is something that we're looking for also. And I think uh, in, in, in this particular situation, it serves all parties involved um, to the betterment to be able to utilize PTLA for that purpose than for, as opposed to issuing a temporary license. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the explanation. All right, this is the moderator and our um, other request for public comment has disappeared from the attending list. So I apologize. Um, at this time, there are no other requests for public comment. Would you like me to go ahead and close the question and answer panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. I do see Dr. Sims on there. Should we try one more time? I don't know if you guys can hear me now. This is Dr. Sims. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah, I, ha I started talking and then um, uh, you're able to get uh, Stacy unmuted and so you went to her. The question I've just processed only that the positions on all these bills says no position. Is that because um, you guys are just going to discuss it today right now or that's already been decided at some kind of uh, other time or that's just a recommendation from the staff? So just kind of a summary on the process. Um, right now, the materials that were provided to you today that state no position is a current um, assessment of today. Um, as a result of today's meeting, those positions could change should the board um, choose to take um, a support or opposition position. Um, we're early enough in the legislative session at this point that we are in communication and negotiation with authors at the legislature to try and iron some of these concerns. You know, we do have some concerns with some of these bills, um, but to offer a letter of support or opposition at this point may be a little premature. So um, unless the board is strong in its convictions and wants to um, jump behind or in front of something uh, today, they can certainly. Um, right now, staff's not making any recommendations for support or opposition, again, because we're so early in the session. Um, but you may find that change at the June meeting where staff does bring um, a recommendation of either support or opposition uh, based on any of these bills and whether they're conducive to consumer, product, um, consumer protection. So um, for today, while we don't have any staff recommendations, the board still could act if it, if it so chooses. Dr. Sims still there? I see a question mark next to his name. Let me go ahead. Uh, that just happens when we don't uh, indicate that he spoke. So I open up the Q&A panel so my co-moderator can, actually I can just grab that. Let me do that. There we go. All right, so I will go ahead and close the Q&A panel now that everyone has spoken and it's closed. Thank you. And thank you, Brooke, for that presentation. Um, we now have agenda item number 14, the rulemaking report. The board currently has six rulemaking items listed on our rulemaking calendar and um, or excuse me, our report. Uh, these items were identified from the 2021 rulemaking calendar that the board submits annually to the Office of Administrative Law. And this helps um, to anticipate the board's rulemaking for the year for them. Um, four of those rulemaking items are currently with BCA legal. I'll go ahead and go into each rulemaking item specifically to provide a um, update. The first item on the rulemaking update is the disciplinary guidelines and they are currently with DCA legal for review. At the September 2020 meeting, the board made some um, slight modifications and staff are currently working with DCA legal to make some final revisions to the package and get it to DCA exact for final review so that it can be sent to agency for their review. 
The um, next item on the rulemaking um, report is the coursework tool, satisfactory documentary evidence of equivalent degree for licensure, the TP or PTA. And this um, rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for their review September um, 2020. The next item is the performance evaluation tool for foreign educated PTs completing a supervised clinical practice in the U.S. And this rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for their review um, also September 2020. And the next item on the rulemaking update is the AB 2138 um, initial rulemaking package. And the notice was published um, by the Office of Administrative Law on June 26, 2020, and the 45-day public comment period um, commenced on August 21st. The board will review a written comment received um, today under agenda item 14B. The next item is the license renewal exemptions, retired license status, and um, board staff will be presenting um, proposed language today for board consideration under agenda item um, 14C. And the last item on the rulemaking calendar is the continuing competency regulations, and staff are currently in the process of researching and developing proposed language um, for board consideration at a future meeting date. Were there any questions on the rulemaking report from board members? Okay, so I, I do have a comment. Um, this is President Ravina Amen. I, I really like your flow chart here, Brooke, um, with the dates and where things are and then where they go. It's a very nice visual to be able to see where things are and the timeline that they're at. And I'm just wondering if for um, board members and especially our new board members, if um, board staff or even our council might be able to explain um, the timelines that are expected for our, our regulations, um, what we um, as board members would typically see for the process to be seen through all the way to the end. Sure, that would be great. Short answer, it's highly variable. It, it, I'm, I'm trying to formulate a response to that request. Um, there is a, the regulations, pro, we've discussed it in previous meetings, the regulations process has changed um, substantially over the last two to three years um, with an additional layer of review. Um, that additional layer of review um, does have some anticipated timeline and I will tell you that our particular packages have not adhered to those um, timelines. Um, I think that there's some things that can um, that can be attributed to, whether it be uh, reassignments of council, a creation of the right unit, um, COVID-19 itself, what have you. Um, but there, there is an expectation that we will start to adhere to some of those previously um, posted timelines. As an example, um, when we receive a package and we send it on to DCA for review, um, I think the expectation there is that there's about a 60-day period of time that we should be giving them for review. And you can tell from our materials that we far exceeded the 60 days at times. Um, so it's something that we're very well aware of, um, and yes, also can be um, frustrating at the same time. Um, even in, in a sense that you know we have five previous packages in play that as the administrator of the program i hesitate to enter into a sixth package but i can only wait for so long to make progress so that's why we're introducing the retired language to you today and also in the hopes that as the reg unit has normalized as um, their staffing vacancies have been filled um, and priorities have been um, shifted from 
controversial packages like 2138 that we'll see an improvement in those timelines um, very soon, if not by the June meeting. Thank you. Um, I don't have um, dates off the top of my head or written down in front of me. I didn't ask for staff to prepare that for me. I just have this sense that um, these reg packages are taking longer than what it took um, from when I first started with the, the board. And I think the regs were being handled by our council at that time. So the reg unit is new. Um, but that's why I bring the, the question forward is because um, yeah, I just want the board members, the public to have a sense of what should we expect because it feels like it's taking a long time. I think feels like taking a long time is uh, an accurate statement because it is taking longer than normal. Um, again, I think there was some of that, some of that delay we could have anticipated with passing of AB 2138. That legislative package essentially meant that every board and bureau within the Department of Consumer Affairs was going to be introducing a regulatory package of change as a result of that legislation. So. Um, about a hundred reg packages as a result from that one piece of legislation. And while I think that that was a satisfactory explanation at the time, I think we're now kind of far past in that, past that process that we should start seeing a, a, a new prioritization of our packages that aren't 2138 related. So um, there will be some changes for PTBC coming up in the near future, a reassignment of counsel from um, the reg unit in BCA, our former um, regula regulations attorney is retiring from state service. Um, and so I think I'll be better positioned uh, at the next meeting to be able to answer a little bit more accurately where we are in those timelines and what the expectation would be. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Um, from board member perspective, I what I understand, and, and chime in other board members if you have comments on this, but um, the reg unit was created, what, two years ago? Was it, has it been two years? And it was created to expedite the process, correct? Correct. Okay, so um, I, I would look forward to whatever you have to in, in June, and also just offer, I don't know that there's much that board members can do, but whatever we can do, if there's anything we can do to help the process move along, um, we're, we're here, so we're willing to do it. I appreciate that, and if there is anything, um, obviously I'll bring it to your attention. Um, at the same time, I, I, I'd want to kind of re-stress that our expectations are high for that particular unit as well, and so, Again, as, as that unit starts to normalize, um, these, these timelines that we've experienced as of late um, would not be considered acceptable in the future. We would, we would be creating a little bit more of a stir mm -hmm. and expectation to get our work done um, much more efficiently. I think that's why I brought up um, in the beginning that, you know, I don't have dates, I don't have hard objective data from what it looked like before the reg unit, but I mean, certainly would expect it, the timeline to be better than what it was, right? Anecdotally, I can agree. Um, I could certainly put something together. I think it's futile. I think it's kind of, uh, you know, I, again, I, in collaboration with ECA's reg unit, um, I don't necessarily, I don't think it's necessary to have to do that. I think that the anecdotal argument is um, clear and concise, right? There, I mean, it's fairly easy to look at even these um, visuals today. We have initial phase packages starting in 2017. We're in 2021 now at this point. So to give um, current board members and new board members an idea, theoretically, a regulation package should, could be done within a year. You know, that, that's been my experience as the administrator of this program in the past. Um, obviously, four years is inoperable. It, it's far too long. I will say, um, maybe not in defense, but maybe an explanation of the reg process um, and that prioritization with 2138. 
some of the regs that we have in the hopper, in the queue, um, on a prioritization scale kind of fall within nice-to-haves. Mm -hmm. As an example, our model guidelines, this is our sixth edition of the model guidelines, meaning we have five editions before that, we, that are still operable today that we rely on. And they are just guidelines. There are things that we can um, follow or stray from, depending on discretion. So a sixth edition might fall on the prioritization list, you know, in consideration of something like 2138. It was highly controversial um, and a demand, if you will, of the legislature. Um, the coursework tool regulation or the performance evaluation tool regulation, all those things, um, in, a, in a way, are nice to have in the sense that some of them we're utilizing today based on the legislation, not based on the regulation. Mm -hmm. So the regulation will bring clarity um, and much needed clarity to the conversation, but it will just reinforce the actions that we're doing today. The retired status is a good example of that as well. We have um, the Business Profession Code 464 legislation to act off of, but we need regulations in effect to implement certain components of the regulation language. Um, so again, it's not it's not not provided as an excuse, if you will, just maybe some context. Um, I think you'll see staff has been very uh, accommodating to those timelines. We we've held up our end of the bargain, if you will. Um, Rebecca Marco, who is the former executive officer of this board, has stayed on as a retired annuitant to help out with these kind of things, um, and. You know, kudos to her because we all feel that same frustration of what the regulation process used to be compared to what it is now, um, and maybe not quite understanding where some of these delays are created. So, um, but we look at forward to working with DCA in collaboration to make sure that our our packages are handled timely and accurately. Yeah, I, I appreciate that perspective. I mean the regs aren't quote unquote on fire, right? And so I, I appreciate you explaining that. Um, and I don't know if now is the time to ask this or later in budget, but I wonder are there any extra costs that the board is incurring because of the delay or not necessarily? Well, there's certainly extra costs as a result of the delay. Um, how, how you would go about calculating those costs is a bit of a mystery because you pay, we pay for DCA's legal services through pro rata, right. um, but this is an extension of time. Right? So we could be getting more out of this process year after year than having these packages take year after year. Um, but so to try and tabulate how much the cost difference is from one year to another is, I would say, practically impossible. But um, again, as the administrator of the program, by this time in June, you know, I, I would I would expect four out of five of those previous packages to then resolve and move on to the next step. That'd be great. So, that looks great. I, I'm. They would be great in the sense that staff are eager to hear what you know through a hearing what our stakeholders have to say about these regulatory packages. Mm -hmm. We want that next step to happen. Can I please invite um, board members to unmute if you have any questions or comments? And moderator, can you please facilitate public comments? Thank you, Madam Board President. I will open up the Q&A panel. If any members of the public would like to make a comment, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. This is the moderator. I see no request for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel?
Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, let's look on our agenda. We have um, some reports and updates that I'm looking forward to hearing. Um, I'm sure board members are as well. I'm just looking at the time and wondering, uh, it's 11 o'clock and were these reports going to be made after a certain time or is it okay to take some of them now? Um, we still have two regulatory packages to, I'm sorry. Okay. to address. Okay, so we're not quite done with uh, 14. We have B and C that we need Correct. to get through. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Brooke. So for agenda item 14B, um, we have three proposed packages for um, legislation that was created under AB 2138. Um, the packages and the language are contained in the agenda materials and we received one um, piece of public comment um, that we have to address here. Um, and in the briefing paper, you'll see an explanation, a summary of what that comment was as well as attached to the package, the actual comment received from the public. Um, and we do have a, a motion, staff has a recommended motion to provide to the board on how to move forward. Um, and with that motion and explanation that's provided in the briefing paper, I'll have Brooke um, read the motion. The proposed motion um, to move the package forward, um, the suggestion would be uh, the motion to move to direct the executive officer and staff to accept the comments on the board's behalf, but reject the actions requested in the comments, provide the response to the comments as indicated in the meeting materials, and authorize the executive officer to take the necessary actions to finalize the text and other documents, including delegating to the executive officer the authority to make any technical, grammatical, or non-substantive changes that may be required in completing the rulemaking file, and then taking all steps necessary to file the regulation package with the DCA Executive Office, the California Business Consumer, Consumer Services and Housing Agency, and then with the Office of Administrative Law to complete the rulemaking process. So moved. This is Katerina. I would request to have some discussion about these items before making such a motion. So I think Jason, but, I think but my heart, but my heart agrees. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. So you, would you like a summary of the comment itself? Is that okay? Or even yeah. So the. The correspondence that we received subsequent to the hearing, um, the comments received in it, um, essentially the issue at hand is that the language um, in our current regulatory packages appear to be uh, vaguer, less clear than our current existing regulations that were on file previous to 2138. Um, I understand the concern of the requester, um, but it's one of the, this, the, the proposed language that you have before you is as a result of the legislation um, in 2138. And while our current language does have, I would agree, more clarity, um, the legislation that it's rooted from has changed. And so the language that you have in front of you, the proposed language, is a result of that 2138 legislation. Um, there is, there has been some expressed concern throughout this process that our current proposed language, which is based on template language received from the department, is kind of redundant to the statute itself, um, which can be a problem with OAL and its acceptance and codifying the regulation but we've been assured that those conversations have been had at the agency and department level with the Office of Administrative Law. And we also know that this package, one almost identical to it for another board, um, has made it all the way through the process and has been put into effect. Um, so while we acknowledge um, the comment, the change that would have to happen would have to happen at the legislative level. 
Um, and so we will just answer back to the commenter that um, we appreciate the comment, we understand the comment, but there's not much we can do with it during the rulemaking process. It's something that would have to be handled at the legislative level. Thank you, Mr. Kaiser. Any further board discussion? Madam President, um, just to clarify, um, where where is this particular item or this group of items in the rulemaking process? Okay, I just went back to the to the rulemaking piece, and I'm trying to place it. So we've had a. We We've had the 45 day public comment period. We received comment. And if you'll see on page 61 of the materials, we're going to be entering into the final phase of review. Um, addressing these comments um, and having that public hearing. Thank you. So this, this language has been uh, through DCA legal already Correct. and made it back to us. And um, so there has been um, uh, agency review of the language um, and that ap appreciating um, Ms. Wong's comments um, that it has been the, the language has essentially been vetted and has been has been deemed as being acceptable um, from from agency's point of view. Correct. That's correct. Okay. Correct. And then, I mean, meaning, meaning that the that agency has been involved in the conversation about this language from the inception of the 2138 legislation. So, um, and again, this is the the package that I kind of discussed earlier, where we talked about. Um, every board or bureau within the Department of Consumer Affairs would essentially have to write regulations as a result of this legislation. And so 100 packages at once. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but not much. Um, there's 37 um, boards and bureaus within the Department of Consumer Affairs, and every one of them was touched by this particular piece of legislation. And so some of them might be doing one regulatory package, some of them might be doing three. Um, we had to do three because we already had regulatory language in place that needed to be amended. Um, Thank you. Now, now that language has been through an extensive back and forth process between our staff and DCA legal and the reg unit, um, as well as kind of a collaboration about, amongst the other boards. You know, we it's kind of one of those situations where we say never go first and never go last. Um, we're probably going third or fourth at this point. Um, and one of the other boards has successfully made it all the way through with the template language, not without its own hitches, right? So while we had agreements with um, agency and the Office of Administrative Law, there were a couple of hiccups along the way. We learned from those hiccups. We brought you amendments to that language in um, previous meetings last year. Um, the board adopted the language. We sent it back for a legal review. We made it past that point. We published it for a 45-day comment period. We received the comment. So here we are today addressing that public comment. I'm wondering if I could, if we could ask uh, Mr. Connotes to comment um, on on the um, on Ms. Wong's letter and and comments. Um, her her letter and comments are written were written as an a bar applicant um and she acknowledges in her letter that part of uh her background um for writing this comment is based on a paper that she wrote um it looks like as a part of a of a project in law as a law student um so she has a little bit of interest there because of some prior research that she's done. But I'm wondering if 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 uh, Mr. Knotz can make any would make any comment. Of course, I'd just like to add that we also have the regulations unit Clay Jackson um, with us also. So if the moderator could promote him to panelist, I know that he has his hand raised, but we can invite him into the conversation also. Um, and I'll let Michael answer to that question. Uh, Wonderful. Good, good. Good morning, Dr. Drummer and members. I, 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 I would defer on this matter to Mr. Jackson, and it looks like he's unmuted now. 
Good morning, uh, Dr. Drummer and members of the board. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Ms. Wong has, since writing this letter, uh, passed the bar, and, and, and uh, so she's now an attorney, and she is a licensed physical therapist as she starts her letter. Uh, looking at what you've asked, there's essentially two questions. First, uh, the overall gist of the letter, as uh, Mr. Kaiser said, is requesting items that are outside of what this board can do. It's important that the board follow the authorization under 2138, that it, wherein it's required to to do certain things to its regulations, which it has done. Uh, the uh, there is actually, I believe, uh, six to ten boards that have now passed OAL, and are, and so you're going to be uh, in the early part of the middle as to when your board's going to get approved. Uh, this package will have to go back to executive and agency once the uh, final statement of reasons has been completed, and. Uh, and then after that, it will go to OAL for final review. The um, points Ms. Wong is making uh, are twofold. One, she doesn't believe that the board's language and revisions in uh, its regulation text go far enough in, in solving what 2138 was meant to do. Uh, the, the, language and the and the template language that was created by our office and DCA and the Attorney General's office we believe does meet those criteria that that uh, 2138 made changes to the uh, the issue on scope of transparency is something that we don't uh, I out of all the comments that I've read in the 10 packages that I've had, I, I uh, have never read anything yet on transparency, so that's new. Uh, 2138 intended to do certain things which we've addressed in your regulations. So we believe that they that what you're doing is, is appropriate to meet the concerns of the legislature. Uh, as to the federal issues, the uh, what she's asking, uh, you know, she talks about the uh, there being a complete bar if someone is excluded under the federal acts, and for both of these issues, uh, the the staff has made the recommendation that she, that. Um, Ms. Wong should go to the legislature to make those requests, uh, to which I would agree legally. Um, the board is required to follow the legislation and follow the statutes, which it is doing, and these regulations flesh out those statutes. They are not in conflict with the statutes, and, and if there are legislative issues that Ms. Wong feels are necessary, uh, she should either bring those to the board specifically as legislative issues or or pursue them herself with the legislature. Uh, does that answer your question? Satisfactorily. Thank you very much. Any further board questions or comments? We have a motion by uh, Ms. Ellaby, and wondering if there's a second. We have a second by Ms. McMillan. And moderator, can you please uh, facilitate public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If any member of the public would like to comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and submit it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions. The 
This is the moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yep, please. Thank you. You're welcome. And can we have a roll call vote, please? Alicia Benina. Aye. Dale Armstrong. Pardon me, Madam President. I'm sorry. Could you please, um, uh, could we ask uh, Brooke to please reread the motion? Of course. Absolutely. Thank you. The proposed motion um, to move the, the package forward uh, would be moved to direct the executive officer and staff to accept the comments on the board's behalf, but reject the actions requested in the comments, provide the response to the comments as indicated in the meeting materials, and authorize the executive officer to take the necessary steps or excuse me, actions to finalize the text and other documents, including delegating to the executive officer the authority to make any technical, grammatical, or non-substantive changes that may be required in completing the rulemaking file, and then taking all steps necessary to file the regulation package with the DCA Executive Office, the California Business, Consumer, Services, and Housing Agency, and then with the Office of Administrative Law to complete the rulemaking process. Thank you. Roll call vote, please. Alicia Ben Amen. Aye. Dale Armstrong. Aye. Jesus Dominguez. Jesus Dominguez is absent. Daniel Drummer. Aye. Katarina Ellaby. Aye. Jonathan Urban. Aye. Tanya McMillian. Aye. Six to zero, motion carried. Thank you for it. And agenda item 14C. Fourteen C is new language um, to be brought before the board um, as it pertains to retired license status. It's something we've discussed in the past. Um, I think some of some of our board members are were familiar with a long ago time where we had introduced a different regulatory package to create regulations for retired status. Um, and while we were in that process, essentially there was new legislation passed that affected all of the business professions code. Um, and it provided much more um, latitude and leverage. And we would rather write regulations based off of that um, general statute and the general provisions of the BMP Code 464 than we did of our own um, existing statute. And so in our last sunset, we asked that that existing statute be sunset after a year um, so that we had enough time to codify regulations. Um, that time, that sunset period, if you will, has come and gone. Um, and we have been operating under 464 and 464 solely for a long time now. Again, as I kind of expressed earlier, I, I hesitated as the administrator in introducing another package with five packages already in process. Um, but this is something that I think that could benefit licensees and the board and its administrative services. Um, and so we want to start the conversation. Um, we brought language to your attention to review and discussion. There are a few pieces that are still um, left undecided, mostly um, the fee and the anticipation of what we might think that that fee is going to be. And so we're doing an assessment of um, the work involved and how we can go about recouping those costs and administering the services to the, um, our stakeholders. So other than the fee, um, we think that the package itself is pretty um, concise. It is modeled after a couple other boards that have very similar language. Um, and again, so that that retirement package has made it through the process all the way through the OAL approval. Um, nothing very controversial really in the package itself. Um, and we anticipate having the fee study concluded by the June meeting so that we can have that before the board as well. Thank you for that. So do board members have any questions or comments about the language that's before you on uh, page 75. Okay. 
and, and do uh, board members need to discuss at this point, Mr. Kaiser, um, the highlighted areas? So the highlighted areas here are, are simply form numbers that we're going to insert. Um, we have a current application that we utilize for retired license status. Um, we can provide that as um, information at the June meeting to review. The application works very well. It's very simple. Um, it's not as complex as, say, a renewal transaction. Uh, we do ask a, a couple of the same questions. We will be asking for a much um, reduced fee. We're not really sure what that fee is going to be just yet. We envision anywhere between $75 to $100, but again, we're still conducting that study. Um, and there will also be an ability for some a licensee to come out of retirement. And so as long as they come out of retirement within five years of being um, in that retired status before their license would go into a canceled status, they could return just by paying the initial um, renewal fee that is whatever the renewal fee might be at the time. Um, so currently the renewal fee being $300, if they want to return from retired status, they would pay that $300 and attest under penalty of perjury that they have at least 30 hours of continuing education within the last two years, um, and they would return to active status. And where does that five-year explanation and the Con Ed explanation, where does that language live? Uh, th this is Michael Knuth, your board counsel. I, I assisted staff with drafting some of this language. and. Um, I, I, I hate to uh, contradict our esteemed executive officer, but at, at five years, the way Business and Professions Code Section 464 authorizes this regulation is that it only would be those steps that are required to restore the license to active status. So it would not go into canceled status after five years. It would remain in that retired status unless or until the, the the retired licensee fulfills uh, the the requirements that are listed in the regulation, namely to uh, complete a, a different form that would restore the license, uh, paying the biannual uh, renewal fee, satisfying continued competency, and if necessary, uh, uh, fulfill the fingerprinting requirements if if they're not on file already with the Department of Justice. Okay, so they would pay the fee, complete the form, every two years renew as retired and pay that fee, or it just stays that way? It would just stay that way. So it stays that way forever unless, well, nothing. It can never cancel. It can never, never get suspended. It just is a retired license. And then if that person decides to come back into a full license, then they take the steps necessary to, to do that. That's, that's correct, Madam President. Thank you. But they can only do that within the first five years of being in retired status to come out of it. That, uh, Dr. Drummer, that, that is incorrect. Okay. So they would stay in retired status in perpetuity and, but, and could come out of it after, after a five-year period. So it would not um, after five years, go into canceled status. It would just remain in retired status. And so currently, um, somebody who goes into delinquent status because they have not renewed and they have not opted for a retired status piece at this point, if they remain in delinquent status for five years, at five years, then they become canceled status? Uh, there may be a, a slight disagreement between the administrator and counsel at this point. Um, I, I'd ask uh, counsel to review 2647 of the BNP, which is um, essentially states a person who fails, <coughs> excuse me, to renew his or her license within five years after its expiration uh, may not renew it and it shall not be reissued, reinstated, or restored thereafter. However, the person may apply for a new license if he or she satisfies the requirements set forth in Article 3, um, commencing with 2635. And so I think that's a, where we might disagree on a general understanding is whether or not 
entering into retired status is actually renewing the license prior to its expiration. But I certainly think it's something that we'll come to consensus with before we bring the language back to you at the June meeting. Yes, I was. I, I, I heard your question, Dr. Drummer, to be what, um, how does a delinquent status impact the ability to go into retired status? And an individual who is in currently in delinquent status would uh, a licensee would not be able to enter the retired status in the delinquent status um, until that was resolved. That that much we definitely agree on. But with regard to section 2647, my thought is that's going to apply to a non-retired license. Because Section 464, which authorizes the establishment of the regulation for retired status, uh, does not, the only conditions on, an, uh, on a licensee returning to active, active status from retired status are listed in that section. And, and those would be negated if the license went into a canceled status after five years. So there is a little bit of a, there's a bit of a conflict here that perhaps we should discuss more. And I think, and I think potentially part of it might just be an oversight in the intent of the legislative language of 464. Um, and I think I hear that as part of kind of the questions from the members is that the difference being between a licensee who does nothing unless their license go into delinquent status, that license would cancel after five years as it pertains to 2647. But somebody who has exercised 464 to enter into retirement and potentially 20 years later could come out of retirement just by simply attesting under penalty of perjury that they haven't committed any crimes and that they've received 30 hours of continuing competency within the last two years, and then they would be valid to practice. Um, and I think those two things are slightly inconsistent in concept, um, but I think it's something outside of the language that um, council and staff and I can review and get a, a more definitive answer for you at the next meeting. Um, I'd be curious to kind of see how it has worked out for other boards that have um, actually passed language as a result of 464 and practically what they're doing in a real life situation. So, Another board member um, comment, question um, about the language that's before you? Are you hoping to get um, action to move forward today? I actually, given the conversation, I don't think that we're ready for that kind of action. Um, the only action that we were actually looking for today is that we're on the right track with the board and that the language looks good to move forward. Um, I think we've discovered a, a, an issue that needs to be resolved. But again, we plan on bringing this back to you in June with the assessment of the fee. Um, and the actual form itself. Nice. So I think there's time for that. Nice. Okay. I look forward to the results of the cage match. <laughs> okay, moderator, can you please facilitate any public comment? Thank you, Madam Board President. I have opened up the Q&A panel and if any member of the public would like to make a comment on this agenda item, please type. I would like to make a comment using the field in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send it to all panelists. We are displaying instructions for your reference. This is a moderator. I see no requests for public comment at this time. Would you like me to close the Q&A panel? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. 
So now we're on to um, our report. And it's 11.40, so just want to check in um, to see when we might want to return. Either 12.30 or 1. Is 12.30? 12.30 okay. Okay. So it is 11.39. Let's recess for lunch and come back and start right up at 12.30.